Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you to our final South Talk semester. I'm Ralph Eubanks, a visiting professor of Southern Studies here at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. I'm really happy to be here this afternoon to, um, for a conversation with uh, Joshua Myers, who is Associate Professor of Africana Studies in the Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University. We're going to be talking about his book, We Are Worth Fighting For which is the first history of the 1989 Howard University protest. This was a three-day occupation of the university's administration building and was a continuation of the student movement that took place at Howard in the 60s uh, and presented some unique challenges in the 1980s. The outcome of this is that students were upset with the university's appointment of Republican strategists Lee Atwater to the Board of Trustees of Howard University. Uh, and students forced the issue by shutting down the operations of the university. So I want to welcome Dr. Myers here to talk about um, his book, We Are Worth Fighting For. He is going to be talking about it in conversation with John Shockley, who was a student uh, at the time of those protests in 1989. So I want to welcome Joshua Myers. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Eubanks. It's an honor um, to be uh, here with you all. Um, I want to thank uh, the Center for the Study um, of Southern Culture. I think I said that right. <laughs> At University of Mississippi uh, for the invitation. It's been a whirlwind of activity uh, with this book. Um, we've been all across the country even before um, the pandemic and ever since the pandemic has happened, there's been even more um, of a response to uh, this work. And so all of that being said, I think this is the first or the second trip to the South, even though I consider DC to be part of the South. Uh, but this is the second uh, virtual trip, actually did a physical trip to Winston-Salem State University in North Carolina. And so this is the first uh, virtual trip to the South. So it's, it's very much, um, an honor for me to be here um, and be in conversation with you all. Unfortunately, um, Brother Jam is having technical issues um, and I'm trying to get him to sign on as an attendee. Um, and if that doesn't work, uh, it'll just be me uh, talking today. Um, but hopefully that works because every time, every time that we've done this work, um, it's been uh, with, with a actual participant um, of the student protest alongside us. Um, and I say, I keep using collective pronouns because I actually did this work in collaboration with them, right? And so we uh, worked together in, you know, developing the premise, the outline, um, everything that went into um, the construction of this work um, was done in collaboration with the students who were involved in the protest. Um, I was drafted by, um, some of the members of a group called Black Neo Force, which is at the center of this protest, um, to um, write this particular text. We shared a history of Howard University um, student activism. I was a, a member of the student government when I was on campus at Howard University. Um, one of the legacies of this protest was that they took over student government um, a year or two, a year and a half after uh, the protest to sort of make sure that they could sustain um, the momentum of this movement. And so um, the premise of this particular presentation is really um, the idea that this is ongoing, that this is not just a historical moment or a historical relic. This is something that um, is still urgent, still necessary. And I'm thinking about this in two ways. One is, of course, the um, continued role that the university plays in sustaining um, systems of power and domination uh, based on um, race and other um, oppressive modes of differentiation. But the other thing is, I think, is the collaborative, the beauty, the ingenuity, the ways in which people of African descent primarily have reimagined these particular spaces to do something differently within them. And to me, that's the thing that we have to focus on and hone in on because the university is, is not 
we know it's not sustainable for the kinds of projects of human liberation that we know we have to embark upon. We know that the university is not you know, created for that purpose. And so for us, we have to understand that the history of this creative reimagination is the only one of the only routes to doing something different. And so for me, history is not um, about, you know, talking about interesting events in the past. Um, you know, there's some back and forth between me and some of the reviewers, early reviewers of the text, because they wanted to understand how this was significant to the, you know, the study of American history. And, you know, when I brought that back to some of the protesters who were involved in the, in the movement, they said, we don't care. <laughs> Meaning it's not about advancing the project of disciplinary American history. It's about understanding that we have to tell our story about the time that we struggled against this particular um, version and instantiation of white supremacy because we're still facing that. So there's a more, there's a more urgent kind of, um, there's more urgent objective here. Um, and that is what sort of guides my thinking because I'm not a historian, right? Um, I'm a scholar of black studies. And so that kind of, that kind of guided my thinking in uh, developing uh, this particular project. So um, that being said, it's looking like uh, Jan won't be able to join us, but I, I did prepare some comments on um, some of the themes that I sort of um, just got, got finished introducing. And, and um, I'm gonna actually read a few of those comments. And so that'll sort of segue us into uh, what I hope is a conversation about what is worth fighting for in the university. Um, black students have struggled to reimagine the university. The struggle is one still worth fighting for. In the 1980s, when the white word, when the right word momentum shook the world to its core, black student movements offered an alternative vision. In that vision, the university could be a place that spoke directly to the centrality of the black experience in both curricular design and in its relationship to the local and global community of black folks, of which that experience was real and urgent. To believe that the university could be such a could be such a place was necessarily to was necessarily to reimagine it. For there was no university in the modern Western tradition that had so that had been so organized. But this was not utopian, not, nor was it fanciful. If there could be a black, black university, that is a space that is more than just a collection of black people, then Howard University had as great a chance in realizing that dream, to quote Tony K. Umbara, than many other spaces. The movement to decolonize the university then is for us too. But it must take into consideration that the specter of colonialism is very much alive in the society not in the archaic monuments that it, society has created to memorial, memorialize itself. And so this is an ever more urgent recognition. This has continued resonance for us, not just me, you know, as someone who is a student and now teaches at Howard, but for all of us. If we're going to stay in the university, then the whole structure has to be redone. We can no longer accept the academy as is. We should have never done so to begin with. And the best of our thinkers did not. In order to keep the same energy, certain keep their same energy, certain choices must be made and certain lines drawn. And we might begin by strongly asserting that the presence of black students is not or should not be merely a diversity initiative or a value add to the neoliberal university. Rather, it is an opportunity to do something different with knowledge, with ideas. And we would hope that that some something different would emanate around the question of human liberation. Stories of student activism, like the one I was blessed to be able to tell and we are worth fighting for, however, are more than about hope. Black students literally put their lives on the line for the vision of a different kind of space. That this took place at an HBCU is of course a necessary condition for not only understanding black higher education in this country, but for conceptualizing how intra-racial tensions have been foundational to black life. The protests that I wrote about and that Jam and others participated in came from students connected to a tradition of radicalism. If one strain of black political behavior has been to seek recognition and to assimilate, the tradition that led this protest represented another strain, self-determination. They were linked to African people around the world who believed that in order to be free, 
It must be on our own terms. I am from the South and know a great deal about university life in these environs, having lived in two university towns, Orangeburg, South Carolina and Athens, Georgia. The struggle students of color face in historically white universities is a critical and urgent concern of mine, just as it was for the Howard students in the 1980s who after their own protest, went across the country to spread the spirit of resistance. There is a deep history of creating communal spaces and organizations alongside students at historically black colleges that might become a useful theater for 20th, 21st century student activism. It is clear that the more allies we have, the better. But it is also clear that neoliberal individuation and hyper market driven culture, such that, quote, I am only here to get mine, becomes the mantra for student behavior and faculty behavior and the behavior of the administration is a hill that we ought not to die on. If anything is to be done with the university, we must develop a sense of what those communal terms might be and how we might struggle to change the meaning of higher education, a la a W.E.B. Du Bois, who in 1933 gave a commencement address at Fisk University in another Southern town, Nashville, Tennessee, and he beckoned to the students, he beckoned to the faculty to basically take the reality that black students and black people can be the founding, the founding terms of their own higher educational activities and their own higher educational objectives and goals. In that speech called The Field and Function of the American Negro College, W.E.B. Du Bois argues that if there is a university that, you know, that that exist in, in England, then the language of that university is English. The culture of that university is English. If there's a university that exists in France, then the language of that university is French and the culture and the history that is taught in that university is grounded in the French tradition. Somehow the American Negro has adopted a university form and function that erases and denies that there is something of value in grounding one's education in the Black experience. And then if that were the only problem, then perhaps we could resolve it by, you know, adding new things to the curriculum and reorienting the curriculum. But, the, but it's more than that, because ultimately, our educational systems are grounded in the terms of our very domination. It's not just that we're learning American culture and American history and learning in the English language. We're learning in the techniques and technologies of domination. We're being grounded in the techniques and, and technologies of domination. And so this is what black student activism has always been about. It's a continuation of the critique of a W.E.B. Du Bois, a continuation of a critique of many of the others like Elaine Locke, who stood on a very, very complicated and real terms that we can be the authors of our own educational destinies. And it is also the groundings of the fight for Black studies. It is also the groundings for the fight of the Black campus revolution that happens in the 1960s and into the 1970s when so many Black people, and then of course, followed by so many brown people and people of color, um, so many Asian folk on the West Coast who said that ethnic studies has to be the groundings for the new university. And so for me, that's the vision that we have to continue in this moment. And we have to struggle against a alternative vision that reifies the individual, that reifies the, the market and says that these are the real terms for how we should navigate society. It is the same market that is actually responsible for not just economic devastation, but the political quandary that African people around the world find themselves in. The university has traditionally been an ally to the very terms of white supremacist, colonial, and imperial, and racial capitalist domination that we have been subject to. And so we need another kind of university. Du Bois and others who are not satisfied simply with reform or the making of avatars of late capitalism to satiate the market. They believed in an otherwise existence. And so whether university is public like University of Mississippi or private like Howard and Tougaloo, it is students who are the most important, most critical to this work of transformation. Sometimes scholars forget that, that we are here for students, right? 
And the moment we forget that, we become less relevant to even the work that we think that we're doing. It is students who have the power and it is students who have the potential and not just the potential, because sometimes potential is read as being unrealized, right? It's already realized. But they sit at the, they sit at the cusp of the very transformations that we are talking about. And though interestingly, this is how the Western University was born with students in power. I think we might re-energize that ancient source of power to more fruitful ends. If we are to stay here, I see no other work. To me, that is still worth fighting for. And Jam having the perfect timing that he has, which of course was, of course was a theme um, in the protest. I see his name just shot up to uh, the panelists uh, for this event. And so having said that, um, I would invite uh, Jam Shakwi, who is a Howard grad, a longtime activist, member of the group Black Neoforest, who did so much of the heavy lifting um, in the 19, late 1980s and early 1990s in the Black student movement, who is now really um, involved in everything, has many hats in terms of the Black community, but based in New York, um, and doing really, really important work all across the landscape. I wanna invite Jam to join us so that we can have a brief conversation um, about the nature of not just what you all struggled with in the 1980s, but how you see that struggle looking um, in the present. How does it look for us in the present? So thank you, Jam, for uh, joining us. I know the ancestors are inter probably intervening to make sure the technical glitches um, they, would go away. Work. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, so first I want to just say um, greetings to everyone in the audience um, and thank you to the University of Mississippi and the organization that invited us here. And thank you, Afton, for your diligent work, um, even with calling on the phone, which I got in here. Um, so I just, I'm just now joining in, Josh. I missed whatever you might have said prior to that. Um, so, what do we always talk about, Stan? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so we're gonna start with current time, or we're going back to '89. So I want to. So what? In what ways does the moment in 1989 help us understand what you see happening, particularly in Black higher oh. education, whether it's at historically white colleges or and HBCUs? I know you still, but you still do work uh, with students, yes. and so I know you can see things and you can and you've observed things. So what lessons? To bit of simply, what lessons might we draw from in the, in the late 1980s to deal with things that are happening now? It, it reminds me that we very much still have work to do. Um, and I say that in the sense of, we saw a lot of the seeds they were planting and the tipping the plant at Howard University. And as the saying has always been, as goes Howard goes the black community. So they were pushing very, very hard to establish a black Republican base at Howard University um, with Lee Atwater, the head of the GOP, um, former campaign manager for the first George Bush um, presidency. With him coming in, we could see them trying to lay the groundwork for that. And it's ironic that as I'm in um, some plenary discussions right now with um, my colleagues, April Silva, uh, Conkey Washington, Sheree Warren and others, we are having a, a very heated debate over the role of Black conservatives and Black Republicans at the, um, the National Black Political Convention, which will be hosted in Newark um, by Mayor Raz Baraka, also classmate and, um, and comrade of, of ours. And so- It's connected see, to Jackson, what's happening in, It's connected to what's happening in Jackson. Mississippi yes. as well. Yes, yes. Mississippi is very much in it. Rukia Lumumba, who is the sister of Chokwe, is on the um, the organizing uh, committee as well, um, and, and a very, very strong role and strong positions there. But it just reminds me that, you know, the enemy, they work and they lay out plans decades in advance, literally decades in advance. And while we may be fighting it at the moment, those things, um, they keep going. They, keep, they, they may change hats, they change personnel, um, but they keep going, whatever their intentions are. 
And so it reminds me to remind our youth, we have to be much more cognizant of what's going on other than just TikTok, other than social media, other than our fashion um, um, statements and social, social bearings. You know, we need to really get involved in long-term planning for our community because the enemy makes lots of plans for us that are not in our favor. Thank you. So um, what have you noticed in terms of uh, current student activ activists um, across the higher education landscape? And I wanna you know, think about, um, you know, let's kick it back six years, in fact, um, starting with university, starting with the University of Missouri's football team, mm. um, their response to a number of issues, but primarily police brutality, which, um, you know, just this week, we have another example of the ongoingness of anti-Black violence perpetuated by the police, but it's also perpetuated by the society that actually employs the police, right? Um, and so there's a there was a moment in 2015 where colleges, Black folks in colleges, not just Black folk, um, but students in general at, at colleges, they, you know, connected themselves to Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black lives, um, and police brutality became a very specific um, way and entry point to talking about Black issues on campus. And for us at Howard, um, that was um, made real uh, when James Comey um, was invited, the FBI head who, you know, was, was famous in the news for talking about Black identity, extremists, with it. and also, well, he's more famous talking about the idea of blue flu, um, right. and the dangers of blue flu. And the students at Howard felt that this was a outrageous decision um, to have him give five lectures on campus. And they began to protest um, with direct action um, at the first, at his first um, appearance. And it is actually that issue which propels in the next year, um, you know, the student protest that happened at Howard, the takeover that happened in 2018. But it's not just police brutality, it's not just, you know, changing the curriculum, it's also, um, a robust movement now for dealing with um, campus responses to sexual assault, um, how terrible campuses have been with that particular issue. Um, there is, you know, an increasingly uh, visceral response to the attempt by um, Black athletes um, to oh. connect themselves to Colin Kaepernick and his movement. Um, and so there's so many different things. I don't, you can just pick anyone that you want to talk about. I know you work with well, and University well, of Mississippi being a huge school in terms of, um, you know, having black athletes on campus. I wonder, I'm wondering what you think about that. Given well, your history. Um, I, I believe, uh, that, and I'm going to use an abstract for a minute, but I believe that we have to attack the concept of anti-blackness. We have to understand it as a community and then attack it at every front. Because when I look at the issues that we were fighting for in 89, that they fought for in 2018, that the civil rights movement fought for in 68, 58, these are the same issues. You know, they, they rearranged the deck, the chairs on the deck, but they're still the same issues. Um, even right now, with the with we are under very much under the heel of police brutality. They have not slowed down, they have not stopped. In fact, in some cities, they have um, the police unions have encouraged the, the officers to take a no nonsense, either they comply or whatever happens to them is on them approach. You know, and, and right now we're faced with the situation going on where the Asian women were targeted by a white man, killed by a white man, and the media frames it as um, what can the black community do to be AIDS to the Asian community? And I was just on a clubhouse group. And I asked them this question. Could you imagine if right now when they're saying, please stop um, the anti-hate against Asians, if we started chanting, all hate matters, stop all hate, you would feel offended and incensed by that. But somehow that is not viewed whenever it's anti-Black. It's like so baked into the, the overriding culture of the country that we catch it every single place. You know, people look down in disdain 
at those who do not, who do not want to take the vaccine. Um, and everyone yells, Tuskegee experiment, we know, but the science. And I would tell them, one, you probably have never read Medical Apartheid. Um, so the Tuskegee experiment is but one example. Um, it's the one everyone knows. It's the catchphrase. Just like if you, if you invite someone to speak about MLK, they can give you the I have a dream speech. And that's it. But they're not going to give you any of the, the things he wrote um, or any of the other speeches that he gave. They gave you that one catchphrase. And we have to recognize that there is a concerted effort to make blackness an enemy, a crime, and guilt in its very nature. And so for today's youth, today's students, the challenge would be to address it wherever it rears its head. The fact that the bulk of wealth in the country is tied to real estate, but we are still going through very much through redlining um, policies that prevent black home ownership. You know, so you, you keep the inequities the entire way. Um, the jails, as we know, were a hotspot for COVID during this um, pandemic. And almost uniformly, Democrat or Republican, they refused to get to seek relief for the pr prisoners who are largely black. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to look at it and you know, look at it as a much larger um, approach that the anti-black sentiment exists in almost every facet. You know, Asians will set up their stores in black communities, but then treat every black person that walks in there as a criminal. That's insane, you know? And, and, and so we have to really realize that and understand that. Yes, we should ally with anyone catching hell on the white supremacy, um, but they should also ally with us and not just in word, like, you know, get out there and really get down with the get down. These, these atrocities, oh, I forgot, I thought it was a taser. You're a 29 year veteran and you don't know the difference between a gun and a taser? Mm -hmm. You know, so. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry for going long on that one. No, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're able to, to join us, Jan. Yes, really, thank you. It's, it's great having you here. I wanna talk about a few things with respect to the 89 protest. And I guess maybe a place for folks to to start to understand. I mean, we all know who Lee Atwater was and his role in the Bush campaign, but his appointment to the Board of Trustees, as I recall, is connected with the unique way that Howard University's charter is set up with the federal government. So this is an issue of, of power and power dynamic. So I want to just really kind of go, I mean, I think that's really where that power dynamic begins is with who was in charge of Congress mm -hmm. at the time, who was, in, who, was in, who was president. So could you talk a little bit about that, that power dynamic, which also mirrors the, the power dynamic in Washington, which is a city that has been, you know, kind of the, one, the last colony that we have in this country. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's... I was going to answer it differently until you told us that last part, because Howard, you know, it's private, but it's also funded by the federal government. It's really a unique animal in higher education. I think there are only a few other institutions that are technically private, but also receive a government appropriation. Uh, one is Gallaudet University, um, which is also in D.C., um, a school for the deaf. Um, but... DC's autonomy, of course, is, is a shaky issue. It's been a shaky issue, but home rule, when it does come into place, it leads to this really important political experiment led by the, by the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee, right, which elevates Marion Barry to um, the office of mayor. That's that people say this. No, this was this was Barry. This is Barry. No, it's SNCC. <laughs> it's actually SNCC. Yeah. It's a student movement that is transitioning to trying to experiment with, with holding political power. And they, and they target DC for a reason. It's a vibrant community of black radical thought, right? And there are a number of new books on this very issue um, that interestingly, my book is corresponded with, right? But the point, the, the point that I wanna sort of start with is that Marion Barry is the one who intervenes in the moment of the protest. Where Absolutely. The police, um, under the under the um, authority of the police chief Maurice Turner, um, you know, actually, you know, 
performs a siege on the building and Marion Barry is the one who caused them off. George, George H.W. Bush didn't have the authority to do that. And even if he did, he would not have. And so the question of statehood is really important. Um, but on the appropriation piece, you know, Howard has, has had a long battle um, around the question of appropriation. I think in mid, 19, mid to late 1930s, um, there was now, it was elevated into a line item in the federal budget, which of course, you know, has to be approved every year. Um, and during that time, I think, I don't know if this is still the case, um, but every year, the president of the university has to go down to justify why <laughs> Howard still deserves this line item, right? During the years of the pro, in the 80s, it was actually half of the entire budget of the university. So without it, yeah. Howard University was half a close at that point, right? And so the reality was that during the 1980s in America, the right wing was ascendant, right? They were on, they were on top of the world. Reagan wins two terms and then his vice president wins a term, right? And so I tell my students all the time, imagine Trump winning two terms and then Mike Pence winning another term. How bad off would we be by the, by the beginning of Mike <laughs> Pence's first term? And so that, that obviously is the, is the foundation for why students were so angry. Like the hip hop generation had just dealt with two terms of Reaganism. Right. Well, and, and, Reagan, and, Reagan, begin, and right? Reagan begins and Reagan begins his yeah. campaign for president at the Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi. Right. And and so students are like speech. young people are like, we're not doing this again. And they put a stop to it in, in many ways. Um, and it wasn't just by voting for Clinton. Right. It was it was doing other things. Right. right. Um, so that that's one part of the story. But Howard felt that it was best to negotiate and play within the realm of politics as usual, which meant that you got to play ball with the Republicans. You have to play ball with these folks. And so that's where Lee Atwater comes in. Um, you know, the president at the time was actually a car carrying Republican, James W. Cheek. Um, he was more than a car, he was honored. He was, he had won the Presidential Medal of Freedom given to him by Ronald Reagan. Right. Um, and so that was, I mean, imagine that being that exalted in the Republican pantheon at that time as a black person. And so to, for him, Lee Atwater is just a logical extension of what we've been doing. Um, but the students felt that this was a step too far and they were right eventually. I mean, I mean, they were right. They stood on principle because principle matters more than politics. And so but, they, ended up being, they ended up being correct um, by, by yeah. taking a stand. Let me jump Again. in. It's not, it's not just the extension because um, you know they label us the conspiracy theorists, but there were several concerted efforts to, to push the conservative mindset, right? You know, there were clubs that were popping up on campus that weren't there previous. The expansion of the ROTC program um, was another big thing that we had noticed. You know, we were, you know, our own hubris, we kind of thought that they were expanding the ROTC because of our organization, Black Nia Force, because they had had a real mainstay in Douglas Hall. Um, at that time, they had like, they were growing downstairs in Douglas Hall. And we thought, wow, they're really doing this based on us meeting in 116. It was not the case, but there they were several inroads that were um, being uh, uh, established, not just, um, the, I think the fact that Howard's budget and where it falls in this line item. I think those things are matters of convenience. They made it easier, but they know as goes Howard goes the black community and getting one of their guys um, who is the, he's the, the architect of all of this craziness that we exist in right now. You know, he, he is the, the Carl Rove mentor. He, you know, the, the, the hyper, the hyper social issue, um, the hyper demonization of social issues. Th Steve these Bannon. are all. Okay? <laughs> He's basically Steve Bannon. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. Right. I mean, so re I mean, that's really what you what you've got going on there, and it's 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 an interesting kind of push and pull of a power dynamic, and you know, kind of thinking, kind of working with that idea of 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 a dynamic. It is. It's really interesting that this is a book that you developed with the people who were part of the protest. That's really very unique. What was it like developing 
I know you say you're not a historian, but you've really developed a work of history with the mm -hmm. participants of that history. Could you, the two of you talk a bit about what that experience has been like? It's, it's, it was actually nerve wracking at first because I come from a tradition where you have to have not only permission to tell other people's stories, but you have to be prepared to do it at the same time, right? And so I, I told um, you know another, another one of our comrades, Akanke Washington, that you had more faith in me than I had in myself. And so to be able to do this, and I think over time, as we grew closer, um, you know, the nerve wracking part gave way to, okay, now we gotta make sure that this becomes an extension of the political project, not just a historical relic, right? So people that have a book and say, here's my souvenir, here's a book that we did, <laughs> we did a protest and here's my, and this is what I got out of it, a souvenir, my name is in the book now. We didn't want it, want it to be that. Right. We wanted it to be something that extended the political project. And so I spent a lot of time talking with um, Akanke Washington, Jam Shackley and April Silver, who, um, whose words are lend the title to the book uh, we are worth fighting for about not just you know getting the historical accuracy, but also how is this going to extend the work that you all started and really continue, it's in the work that they continue. And so, you know, that's, that's what gave me the ultimate will to um, complete this project. You know, but I'm interested in hearing uh, Jan's, Jan's perspective on that too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I look at it in two ways. And I have to say, um, I probably never said this before, but when we first started, um, Akake brought Josh into the mix and said, hey, you know, this, this, we need this. And so I was very um, reticent. I, I, I didn't really know Josh. I didn't know Josh before that. And so I was like, man, I don't know how this is going to go. I am so glad that we um, agreed to and move forward with Josh. The voice he's given it, the lens that he's taken with putting it in the greater context of Black, um, the Black political student movements is just incredible. incredible. And I couldn't imagine to have worked out better. Um, the fact that we were able to give him so many of our people's uh, names and phone numbers, and he called and called them and called them and called them. Um, even meeting with me on one of our occasions where I was officiating um, at the armory in New York City in track and field, and came and, and we sat in the medic room with uh, track happening all around us, my constant running in and out of the, um, the room, um, in retrospect, that is just an incredible testament to his commitment to wanting to catch those things. Um, hell, I've even thought about it in a, in a sense and said, I wish I had um, appreciated it more during the time that it was happening. Um, it made my contribution could have been even better and or greater. But, um, you know, he, he's done a wonderful job framing this thing. Um, I'm, really, I'm really saddened that COVID hit because the book really was, we had really picked up a lot of legs. And this should be a course or, or should be one of the study books in, um, in political science classes on black colleges around the country. Um, African-American studies classes and or political science classes should really uh, use this as one of their re required readings. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's some, I think particularly at a place like, like Howard, where as I think you both have addressed here that that struggle really continues because there were protests several years ago against current president Wayne Frederick with respect to, I think it was budget cuts at the university, um, you know, kind of support of, of students. What's that connection between the issues at, that Howard was facing at with those protests and those of 1989? How are those two events connected? I think it's part, it was in part the issue with the finances. I think it was actually more about their perception of the direction of the university. They adopted the very same language that the student protesters adopted in 1989 and the student protesters in 1968. They adopted the language of the black university, but their perception of blackness was different. And so Generation Z, um, their, their way of looking at the black, the issue of blackness 
um, was of a different, it was a different gradation, right? I think it's, it I was, think it's hard much, to say. Much, much less rooted in, in the, the politics of black um, respectability and much more rooted in- All of that, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I, I just wanna pass this over to Jam and get his perspective because there's a moment in that protest where they reach out to me and I reach out to Jam and April and Akanke, and they literally dropped. I think you had a funeral the same day. Y'all yeah. dropped everything that y'all were doing and came to DC to meet with the students. And so I, I definitely want to hear uh, Jam's response. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, the, 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 unfortunately, the struggles um, haven't really elevated to be new struggles or different struggles. It's kind of like almost a cycle. Um, and I remember someone had put the question out there, what's the difference between being a black university or being a university that's black, right? And that sound, you know, very similar, but, you know, we don't want to be a university that's black. We want to be a black university. Um, I, I spoke to some people recently and told them it's so disrespectful to call Howard the black Harvard. I don't want to be a Harvard of any, 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 any ilk. I don't want to be no part of that. Um, you know, and so, um, you know, unfortunately, I mean, and I, I, I like Frederick. I know him because he was, you know, we were all in the same era, uh, undergrad. And, um, you know, I like him personally, but he does have some, some, some angles that gave the students this voice to say, hey, you're going the wrong way with this, buddy. Um, we need to address some of these things. And I mean, he's, he's lucky. He's lucky that they, that, that we weren't on campus at that time. Um, we, we, and, and I say that, I say that, you know, not to put anybody down or anything like that, but we, we oftentimes surprise them with the level of organization that we had, uh, the level of discourse that we had at our regular meetings. Um, the fact that we had, um, there was no such thing as, male or female leadership. You know, we, we were split pretty much equally um, down the, the board from the head of the organizations to our security um, people. And, you know, so but anyway, I, I don't wanna digress, digress with that. But um, unfortunately, I wish we had new issues to fight, honest to God. Um, and we as a community should recognize something when we're still fighting the same issues decade after decade after decade um how is it the people that get into power keep subscribing to these same belief systems that those who aren't in power have to um fight against it doesn't feel like it's representing them you know um there's been quite a few things that i seriously disagreed with and i look at what's going on at howard um obviously i'm in contact with a lot of alum and you know we speak very frequently, um, but but there are great things that goes on. You know Howard gets a lot of money coming in, fantastic. But you know we shouldn't we shouldn't use that as our measurement of success, just how much money we bring in, or if we can update the the buildings or whatever. You know, being a black university, what does that actually mean, um, and how to put forth you know, the agenda of a black university for a black community um, in this country, you know, so. Well, that, that kind of gets into the issue of kind of the whole market-driven culture that I think that Joshua was mentioning in his, his opening remarks, that that has really affected this. So I guess that leads to my next question is, how does, how do you think that black universities are going, should maybe manage this, I guess really balance this self-determination mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, kind of moving away from this idea of blackness as a crime yes. to with this market-driven culture that is, that pervades us where mm -hmm. someone is talking about Howard as the black Harvard. And what I always say, whenever anyone refers to a place as another Harvard, I always say there is only one. You have to be who you are mm -hmm. rather than aspiring to be someone else. How does, 
how do you balance that idea of self-determination and market-driven culture mm -hmm. in a black university? This is actually a question that I've been asked constantly when we were, um, you know, touring with the book and, you know, Howard alum are very concerned about this because for the older alum, they have no concept of the amount of tuition that students, unless they have children, right? <laughs> the amount of tuition that the students are paying these days. Um, it's really, you know, it's really, a, I think it's, it's actually for me, a call to arms to do two things. The first is black political operatives in this country have to get behind the concept of free college, period. I'm not talking about free, just free community college or free, right. what, I'm talking about free college, higher education across the board. And we have to get rid of this idea that just because rich people will benefit from this, that is something that we shouldn't fight for, right? Free college is to me the bare minimum when we talk about um, you know, what this country should be spending its money on. And to me, I'm with Stokely Carmichael, that shouldn't have anything to do with what the nature of the education that you receive is. No, give us the money and, and, le and leave us alone. In fact, that's, that's justice for black people. Um, Stokely Carmichael in his book, Ready for Revolution talks about how the fact that Howard receives money from the federal government should be seen as an act of reparative justice not mm -hmm. an act of trying to control us, right? And that's the perspective that I take. You know, um, I teach what I want to teach in my classes. One, because I'm in Black Studies and that's what we're supposed to do. Two, because what other opportunity will we have in our lives to convene a space like this where we all we have to do is read and write other Black people? To me, that's an opportunity. And so um, that, that, that's my 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 the way that I practice self-determination on a personal level. But we also know that because the, the federal government has over the course of the last 30, 40 years, persistently taken a step back in terms of funding higher education, we are now subject to the evils of the market, student loan market, the market of yeah. for um, hiring practices. And Howard's, Howard's really engrossed in that because you know when people want diversity, they come first to Howard. And so you have Amazon and Google and all down the list. The CIA, you know, I probably shouldn't have said that, but the CIA <laughs> coming to the first power. Um, and so that's how they that's how they fulfill their diversity needs, which means that they're also paying for access. They're literally investing in accessing Howard in that way. And Howard has to accept that money because the money from other sources is not enough. The federal government appropriation is not enough. Tuition dollars aren't enough even though we need that, right? And so right. this outside funding, they have to say yes to, but how much do you want to say yes to the CIA? Or, yeah. you know, I mean, so that's, I mean, the spirit of your question is very real. And I think the first thing that we have to do is eliminate the problem of, um, you know, tuition, meaning that should yeah, come from the film. So really right. kind of taking the market, taking the market out of it. I want to just kind of make a call for questions. Anyone who has any questions, please feel free to, to ask them. I mean, we've just got a few minutes left and I, you know, I know that Josh and Jan would be happy to take your questions. So um, I wonder if we do have any Howard University alumni who are, who are listening and if they have any um, comments about this. Um, any, any, any questions? And I guess maybe where we can, can wrap up here is if you know each just very quickly what is it that we should be what have we learned from the 1989 protest what have each of you learned from that oh. a couple minutes from each of you that that you want people to know right now I'll, I'll go first because I know you know Jan having experienced it directly um, for me it is they they will do a lot to prevent <laughs> transformation. And whoever the they is, right? Um, whether it's the state, whether it's the market, whether it's the administration of higher of universities, they will do whatever they can to stop us. But to me, that shouldn't mean let's not try. So that's the lesson for me. Okay. 
Okay, Jim. I, I, I'll pull something that Raj used to say all the time. You know, um, my first answer to that question is that we can win. When we fight, we can win. You know, we won in, in the sense of the protest. We won. Um, but we have to be very mindful, something that Raj used to say all the time, is that, you know, they kill us. Let's be clear. They kill us. When we get independent, um, they assassinate us, whether that means heads of state in countries in Africa or leadership, potential leadership here in this country. They eliminate us. But we should still keep fighting because it's far better to, to, to die fighting for betterment for ourselves, for our community, for our families than it is to live um, subject to some of the inhumane things that we're subjected to. Well, I mean, that, that is a perfect place um, to, to wrap up. I want to thank you both for, um, for being a part of this, this program today. I think there's so much that, um, that I think that people who've listened in today can, can take, take away. And I hope that you will come back to the University of Mississippi in person once all of our restrictions lift because it'd be great to have you there. And, and as someone who lives part of the time in Washington, DC, Joshua, I'm hoping that I can, that I will see you sometime when I am walking across the yard, which I do occasionally. Okay. So. Yeah, I'd be happy to come in and you know, put some Kindle on the fire that you already have going down there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And, and listen, it, anywhere there's a fire, you can definitely count me in. Um, you know, but no, I want to thank I want to thank you guys. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Afton, especially Afton for all your extra work, making sure I got on here today. Um, thanks, Josh, um, and thank the student body. You know, keep doing, fight, keep fighting. Okay, okay, and yeah, and thank you all. Thank you both.